how is it possible that you can have a droplet that exists inside of water? It's water in water. Exclusion zone actually describes a, a zone that contains this fourth phase of water. This structure is not neutral. It has negative charge. Unconventional science is absolutely critical, but scientists don't have much of a chance to pursue them. Oh, Antoine, he's a crackpot. Pay no attention to Antoine. Is it a potato battery which can power a clock, or is it something which has much more potential? In it? I think it has much more potential in it. If this guy is right, it's a fundamental change of scientists. Was that intro over the top? No! I mean, we all know it as a fact. There are three phases of water. Flowing at the tap or in a river, it's liquid. If it starts freezing, it gets solid. And if it gets over 100 degrees, it becomes a gas. So when someone comes and tells us, wait, there's a fourth phase. We have to admit that it's a bit surprising to use an understatement. Yet, if the scientific community doesn't fully agree with everything Gerald Pollack proposes in his fourth phase of water book, they nevertheless all agree on something. There's more than just solid, liquid and gas, and that fourth phase of water exists. So bear with me, we'll start by reviewing what that fourth phase actually is, then look at all that it may explain in our daily lives, and finally review how it may be applied in water treatment and the water industry in general. Have you ever looked at a water pitcher and wondered how water was lying inside? Is it like a bunch of water molecules just discarded in bulk? Or rather, a patient and geometric stacking of molecules on molecules? I first got to know Gilbert Lee, and his point of view is that we know liquid water very well, but he said the water molecules are not bouncing around. They're ordered, they're standing at attention, like, like soldiers. At the time, Gerald Pollack was working on muscle contraction, but the more he was discussing Gilberling's theory with his students and colleagues, the more he was convinced he should investigate it. If he's right, this changes all of biology. Oh, by the way, Gerald Pollack leads a laboratory at the University of Washington in Seattle. He's the founding editor-in-chief of the Water Research Journal, the executive director of the Institute for Venture Science, and the author of, among other books, The Fourth Phase of Water. The thing is that water is a surprisingly low investigated field of fundamental science. Maybe because many think what I thought before jumping into today's topic. Come on, after all these years, we certainly know everything about water, don't we? Spoiler, we don't. Maybe also because quite recent instances of people trying to revisit what we know of water didn't end well. Think of Deryagin's discovery of polywater or Ben Venice's exploration of the memory of water. Two topics I'd really like to cover in the future, so drop me a word in the comments if you'd like me to. Yet, when you think of it, there's quite a bunch of behaviors of water around us in our daily lives that we accept as a fact while hoping that someone understands it. Why is ice slippery? Why do waves persist over long distances? How do tiapper hold 50 times their weight in water? Why does warm water freeze faster than cold water? Why does ice float on water? Why can you build a tiny water bridge between two glasses? Why do droplets of water exist in water? I mean, water in water. These are just some of the questions Gerald Pollack claims he may have answered with the fourth phase of water. So what is this fourth phase? Well, what is maybe not the right question to start with. Indeed, it's more about where this fourth phase is. It does form at the surface of water at the interface next to hydrophilic surfaces. Gerald Pollack discovered that when looking at those interfaces, you could notice a particular behavior of water. It was like purifying itself from any other compounds than water, excluding all the other molecules. And that wasn't and all of it. The water molecules adjacent to that surface undergo a radical transformation and they transform from the individual water molecules to a sheet-like array that has a hexagonal motif to it, consisting of hydrogens and oxygens. Indeed, we know the water molecule H2O. In bulk water, it bounces around happily in its typical Mickey Mouse shape. But what Gerald's team found out is that in those interfaces, it was recombining to form 
H302. Let me show you how. Our water molecules will come together to form an hexagon with six atoms of oxygen and six atoms of hydrogen. Then those hexagons will bind themselves with adjacent hexagons through a shared hydrogen atom, adding six half atoms of hydrogen to our structure. Hence, the formula H906, which you can simplify in H302. That first molecular layer then serves as a template for the growth of the second layer, and so on and so on. And these layers grow one by one, and they can grow to enormous lengths. We've seen them grow in, in certain circumstances up to a, a meter. This structure is somewhere in between the vertically stacked up shape of ice and the loosely connected state of liquid water. Hence the affirmation that this is indeed the fourth phase of water. But it still had to get a name to be recognized. We call the exclusion zone a zone that contains this fourth phase of water. It does exclude almost everything from it because it's a dense, tightly packed entity and almost nothing can get into it. In retrospect, Gerald Pollack thinks he may have rather called this crystalline water or semi-liquid water. But the name that stuck is exclusion zone water. In short, easy water. So by now, we know where to find the easy water and what it is. But the next question in line is, how does it form? Gerald's team actually found it out through serendipity, a fortunate discovery by accident. A student found, a student who was doing what he was not supposed to be doing. A postdoctoral student had left the water sample under the microscope in the evening when going home, simply turning down the light. When he returned the next day, easy water had reduced to half the size it was the evening before. But when turning back the microscope slides, within minutes, it regained its original shape. He found that the energy comes from light. Infrared light's incidence on water would trigger a separation of charges, H2O being broken down into H+, and OH-, those OH- then recombine with H2O present in the interface to form H302, or as we named it minutes ago, easy water. Now, light inducing a charge separation, that may make you think of another well-known natural thing, photosynthesis. I'm not certain, but the first step of photosynthesis bears such close resemblance to what we've been studying that I can't help but wonder whether the two are actually the same. Even more intriguing, my saying that infrared light triggers separation of charge in water has probably ring the bell in you, because how do you call a body with a separation of charge. Exactly, you got it right, a battery. We've demonstrated in the laboratory that starting with this battery, you can actually obtain electrical energy. And you'll see in a minute that this may have direct applications in the water industry. But first, let's recap what we've learned in this first part. Principle one, water has a fourth phase. Principle two, water stores energy. And principle three, water gets energy from light. The book adds a fourth principle, like charge entities can attract one another or like likes like. But I won't be covering that one today, so check my full interview with Gerald Pollack if you'd want to know more. The link is in the description. If you need a reason to do so, let me tease you with this. This fourth principle may be the reason why you're able to build wet sand castles with your children to defy waves and tides at the beach. Are you hooked? For now, let's look at how easy water may explain many phenomena we see around us every day. First, if easy water is effectively created by the action of infrared light on water, as Gerald's team demonstrated it, this means that there is easy almost everywhere, from the bottom of the oceans where no visible light passes through but infrared gets emitted, to the inner part of our bodies which are made of 99% water molecules. If you ever type fourth phase of water in Google or even YouTube, you'll swiftly notice that this opens a door to talk about energized water and investigate the theories of Victor Schaub or Rudolf Steiner. I won't do it today, but considering the hype around water ionizers, I'd be keen to dive into it in a future episode. Again, tell me in the comments if you'd be interested. Now, if by now you're still wondering if there is one statue Gerald Pollack would still be reluctant to unbolt, consider this. In his book, he attempts to demonstrate how Brownian motion, the random motion of particles suspended in a medium, may better be explained through the action of easy water than by the traditional theory proposed in 1905. Who formulated it in 1905, you ask? Albert Einstein. I was about to meet Sir Andrew Huxley, obviously not Einstein 
or Archimedes, uh, not that old. Huxley was one of the greats. I learned from that experience that even famous, important people can be wrong because they're human. They do sit on toilet seats and they eat the same food that we eat and they have the same foibles that we suffer. Hence, Gerald's approach throughout the book to apply Occam's razor to any phenomenon he attempts to explain. If you've got two competing ideas, like, for example, God exists or God doesn't exist, probably the simpler one is going to be the one that is correct. I've come to realize that the ideas presented are complicated because they're wrong. Therefore, the book distinguishes the concepts where Gerald's team is certain, like the existence of easy water or the four principles it implies, and the ones which are proposed with reasonable backing as a hint and support for further research. And that ranges from discussing what temperature and heat actually are, to studying how vortexes may cool down water, through explaining why various types of water won't mix, how water-based lubrication works, how water reaches the top of the tallest trees, and many, many more. If you ask me, my favorite one is probably how water bubbles and water droplets may actually be the same. When you see, see a structure that is spherical, how do you know what it is? How do you know if it's a droplet or how do you know if it's a bubble? Sometimes we were quite sure that it was a bubble. It turned out to be an underwater droplet and you wonder, well, how is it possible that you can have a droplet that exists inside of water? It's water in water. If you want to better understand what you're seeing the next time you boil water in your kitchen, dive into my full interview with Gerald. The link is still in the description. Yet, if you're watching this video, you're probably interested in the possible applications of easy water in the water industry. In the book, Gerald Pollack tells how his research team experimented around the battery properties of water. He states that water acts as a transducer, absorbing one kind of energy and converting it into other kinds. He also adds that they were able to extract substantial energy by inserting electrodes into the oppositely charged regions of water practically as much as the electrical energy used to build those charge zones. Hence, it is tempting to see direct use of water as a battery if it really delivers the high yields Gerald hints to. That's why he founded a startup called Fourth Phase Incorporated to work on possible applications of his lab's findings. But as cool as a water battery may sound, the second hot topic Fourth Phase Incorporated is pursuing is probably even more promising and intriguing for a water professional. If you have an apparatus that can create an easy and you collect that easy, if you put water into this black box, the water contains any kind of pollution, pharmaceuticals, microplastics, you name it, it's excluded from the easy. Remember, it's in the name, exclusion zone water, so it sounds logical that it excludes anything that is not water. If it can do so while leveraging renewable energy sources which are widely available on Earth, like sunlight in general and infrared in particular, then it may be a cool prospect to treat raw water, be it as a desalination tool or as a way to produce industrial ultra-pure water. It does work. It works beautifully in the laboratory. But so far, it only works in the lab. It takes an awful lot to cross the so-called valley of death from a laboratory observation to something that's usable in a practical sense. And it requires a, a, a good deal of investment. Funding is indeed the last frontier for Gerald and his team. That is why he's advocating for venture science, said differently, to fund research that defies the status quo, taking into account the risk it involves and seizing the potential it may reveal if it was to succeed. But to conclude, let's take a step back. First, let me tell you that I am a proud water engineer with a decade of experience in the water industry, which gives me some confidence to review, assess, and follow developments in water science, engineering, and applications. But I'm by no means a fundamental physicist or chemist, so I've been looking around to check what the scientific community thinks of Gerald Pollack's discoveries, principles, and theories. It turns out that for most of what I read, everybody agrees that the fourth phase of water exists. Some argue that the laws of thermodynamics actually say that there are 18 phases of water, but considering that 15 of those phases are solid, I'd see that as splitting hairs. Then, when it comes to explain how easy water forms, there are theories that compete with Gerald's light-induced one. To name a few, there is diffusophoresis, as proposed by Michael Shore, 
Casmir Polder forces as brought forward by Antonella De Nino or a brush mechanism proposed by Istvan Usha. Who's wrong? Who's right? <laughs> I can't tell. If you know better, come tell me in the comments. But if you ask me, I find it kind of cool to see people challenging what we think we all know, but we don't. I had not played with atoms and molecules since high school and I found it refreshing. And think of that, if we had solved all the open challenges and exhausted all the alternatives, would we really still have billions of people without water 21 years into the 21st century? I think that the answer is in the question. Check this video if you'd like to further explore unconventional approaches to the topic of water, and if you want a glimpse into one of the most fascinating conversations I ever had on my podcast microphone, check my full interview with Gerald Pollack. The link is in the description.